Do we really need four different types of matrix vector multiplication? Let's explore. Anytime we see the phrase matrix vector multiplication, we might recognize that this actually means one of two different operations. Specifically, we have what we've seen as matrix column vector multiplication, where our modeling matrix shows up on the left-hand side. We call that an M by N. And then we have a vector X, which we're going to think about as our algebraic worker on the right-hand side. That's going to be an N by one. When we do the matrix times the column vector, we produce another column vector that has M rows and one columns, B, where B is equal to A times X. That is one form of matrix vector multiplication. However, we also have a different operation called row vector matrix multiplication, where we start with a row vector X transpose. X is an M by one. When we take the transpose, that becomes a one by M. We multiply on the left hand side of our modeling matrix, which is an M by N matrix that we call A. And then when we hit X transpose times A, we produce a row vector, which has one rows and N columns called B. Notice that the inner dimensions must agree on both of those and the size of the output is defined by the size of the outer dimensions. When we say matrix vector multiplication, we might be referring to either one of these operations. In our work together, we've seen that for each operation, we can produce the outputs in two different ways. One way is to do something called vectorizing the data. In other words, we generate the output as a linear combination of vectors. The other way to produce the output is called scalarizing the data. And that means that we're going to generate the output via the individual entries that we desire. So we have two different versions of matrix vector multiplication, each with two different approaches. This leads to four separate definitions for matrix vector multiplication. Thinking about that, we might wonder, how are all these versions interrelated? And that's exactly where our theorem about the transpose of a matrix vector product comes in. Specifically, this theorem says that if we have an M by N matrix A, and X is an element of R N by one, Y is an element of R M by one, then the following equations hold. Specifically, the matrix column vector product transposed is actually a row vector matrix product involving the transpose. A X transpose is X transpose times A transpose. In other words, we flip the dimensions and the order. The same thing is true in reverse. The row vector matrix multiplication, a matrix column vector multiplication with the transpose of the original matrix. We're going to see that in terms of calculations, we only actually need one version of matrix vector multiplication, and we get the other one for free by leveraging the transpose operation. Of course, I don't want you to trust me. What we're going to do is explore why this should be and really develop a reason for ourselves in our own handwriting. As we dive deeper into this theorem, I want to return to an idea about what it means to learn math at a very deep level. Specifically, I like to say that deep learning and mathematics involves seeking out multiple representations for mathematical ideas. And then I have the following model to help guide you in thinking about how to do that. I call this the Van Visa model. Verbal descriptions, abuelita language, nerdy language, visual representations, inquiry and intrigue, asking questions, writing stuff in symbols, doing procedural calculations. And then at the intermediate level, we're going to move on to problem solving applications and logical descriptions. And in other words, exploring the logical underpinnings of the mathematics that we're working with. For advanced learners, we also move into modeling scenarios using mathematics to model the world around us so that we can verify our guesses and also computer based thinking. How do we code up mathematics on digital computers? In this video, we explore the logical underpinnings, how we prove the transpose of a matrix vector product theory theorem that we just saw. Here we are presented with a theorem about the transpose of a matrix vector product, which is actually two separate statements, both about transposes, one about taking the transpose of a matrix column vector product, and the other about taking a transpose of a row vector matrix product. For mathematical explorers, a theorem statement without a proof is like a joke without a punchline. It's not very useful. As we strengthen your mathematical genius, yes, I believe you have genius inside of you, innate, being born makes you a genius. As we strengthen that genius, one habit I want to help you cultivate is the process of challenging why a particular statement might be true. A very nerdy way to do that challenging is to work to formulate a mathematical proof for every theorem that we see. To generate mathematical proofs, we're going to use a logical construction 
called a conditional statement. All conditional statements are written in the form P double arrow Q. That's read P implies Q. If we want to read that in English, we read if P then Q, where the statement P, the proposition P is called the antecedent and the proposition Q is called the consequent. For any statement that we're trying to prove, we have one of two choices. We can either generate a proof for that statement or we can produce a counterexample. For those math heads watching that want to really learn how to read and do proofs, I cannot recommend this book enough. It's by Daniel Solo. It's called How to Read and Do Proofs. And in that book, he actually discusses many different approaches to generating a proof of a statement P implies Q. The first one we've talked about in previous videos is called the direct method, where we assume P to be true and then show Q is true. There's also the method of contradiction or the contradiction method where we assume P is true and also Q is false. And then we show that there's some contradiction in that statement. And there's also a contrapositive method where we assume Q is false and show that P must also be false. Those are all different approaches to formally validating that P does imply Q. Sometimes when we make a conjecture in the form P implies Q, that conjecture is actually false. And to show that it's false, we must produce a concrete counterexample. To produce a counterexample, for the logical statement P implies Q, we produce a concrete example that satisfies both the condition P and not Q. In other words, we show we can have an example that satisfies P and simultaneously satisfies not Q, which means just because P is true doesn't mean that we get Q for free. In our work to prove the transpo theorem, we're going to use a direct proof that P implies Q. In other words, we're going to assume the antecedents are true and show the consequent. As I said many times in the past, I like to explicitly identify all different P implies Q statements that are hidden in any theorem statement. So in this situation, we're going to break that original theorem statement into two different parts. Proposition one is going to say, if we have a matrix A, which is an element of R M by N, and a vector X, which is an element of R N by one, then it must be true that A times X quantity transpose is equal to X transpose times A transpose. That's the first proposition we're going to show. The second proposition hidden in the theorem reads, if we have A element of R M by N and Y element of R M by one, then Y transpose times A quantity transpose is the same thing as A transpose multiplied by Y. In other words, if we want to translate a matrix column vector multiplication into a row vector matrix multiplication, we hit it with a transpose and the reverse is also true. If we want to take a row vector matrix multiplication and turn it into a matrix column vector multiplication, we hit it with a transpose. Do you see me using both technical and abuelita language? Do you see me turning this into a intuitive description? That's a habit of deep learning and mathematics. I know you can do better because you're cooler, smarter, better dressed, better looking. The one advantage that I have is I've been thinking about math for about 18 years every day of my life. In this video, let's actually attack proposition one and produce two different proofs for that proposition. One for the vectorized version of matrix column vector multiplication and the other for the scalarized version. At this point, we'll attack this problem of generating a proof by returning to our key questions in problem solving. I have a great blog post on this that highlights what I like to say are the keys to solve almost any problem you can imagine. I'll be sure to link to that in the description for this video. But the point is we're going to actually create a simpler problem first as we work to the general proofs for this particular proposition. Remember also we have two different ways to establish the consequent, one of which is called the forward approach and the other one is the backward approach. In the forward approach, we start on the left hand side and work forward towards the right hand side. In the backward approach, we start on the right hand side of our equation and work backwards towards the left hand side. In this video, just like we've seen in the past, we're going to use both interchangeably to get towards a valid general proof of this particular proposition. So remember, we want to use a simpler example to get insights into the general case. This is a great exercise in creativity. We want to generate an example that's hard enough to be interesting and easy enough to be done quickly to generate intuition about the general case. In my case, I'm going to go ahead and assume that A has five rows and four columns. And we'll start with X being a column vector, which has four rows and one columns. And we want to show for these dimensions and general matrix A and X that A times X quantity transpose is the same thing as X transpose times A transpose. Again, we're going to use two different approaches, both scalarized and vectorized. I'll start with the scalarized approach 
because why not? To this end, we have two separate vectors. We're going to have the vector a times x, which we're going to call b. That's going to be an m by 1. And then we'll look at the vector x transpose times a transpose, and we'll call that r, which is going to be a 1 by m. This theorem is telling us that the transpose of this product must be equal to this vector x transpose times a transpose. So in this particular approach, we want to show that the transpose of b is equal to the vector r. Since we're working with the scalarized approach, we're going to look at the vector on the left-hand side and the vector on the right-hand side via their individual entries. And we know that two vectors are equal if and only if each individual entry is equal. In other words, we say b transpose equals r if and only if the kth entry of b transpose is equal to the kth entry of r. And that's true when k goes from 1 all the way to m. In our base case that we're working with, m is 5, but this must be true for any dimension, right? Do you see me making the connection between the example and the general case? In other words, we want to show that b sub k equals r sub k for all possible values of k. Since we know we want to look at the individual entries, let's think back and start testing ourselves. Remember that the whole goal of all these activities is to strengthen your brain. The neural networks in your brain that encode these ideas need exercise to get stronger. One of the best way to do exercises is called active recall. Closing your eyes, pausing the video, really trying to test yourself, make mistakes, and then correct. So here's a question that I have for you. Which version of matrix column vector multiplication allows you to look at the individual entries? And what's the technical definition that comes up in that case? Pause the video, test yourself. I'll go ahead and give you the answer by showing you what this looks like. Okay, I'm looking for matrix column vector multiplication by entries. So I'm thinking matrix column vector by entries must be matrix column vector multiplication via dot products. And I know that the ith entry of a column vector B is going to be the ith row of A multiplied by X. Now, I don't expect all of you to be able to do that off the top of your head. I've been studying this concept for about 12 years. So I have it already memorized, but that's how I memorized it. I test myself on a daily basis for long periods of time, and then I would check the answer. Indeed, when I check my answer, I see that if I have an m by 1 column vector, which is a 5 by 1, and I want to produce the individual entries, I chop the modeling matrix A into rows, and then I take the dot product of each row with the column vector x. So for the first entry, that's a11 times x1 plus a12 times x2, and I move all the way across the rows and down the column vector x to produce that first entry. Same thing for b, first with first, second with second, third with third, fourth with fourth. Add all those up, I get the second entry, and I do that five times in this case. General case would be m times to get the individual entries of the vector b. This implies that I have a formula for the kth entry of the vector b, which is given by the kth row of a dot product with the vector x. I can write that in summation notation. j goes from 1 to n of a k j x j. The column index on the entries of a aligns identically with the row index on the entries of x. The k row index on the matrix A aligns with the entry of the desired output vector that we want. This formula holds for all values of B, which means when I take the transpose, the only thing that changes in the transpose is the dimension of the output. The individual entries have the exact same value, which means this holds for the transpose. That last one gave us a forward approach. We start on the left and work towards the right. Let's go a backward approach now. Let's look at the right-hand side. We're going to define the vector r, which is x transpose times a transpose. We want an individual entry approach to this. Which version of matrix vector multiplication allows us to deal with a row vector times a matrix in a scalarized version? pause the video, test yourself, write the definition down. I've already done that for myself, and I know that when I take a row vector times a matrix, I can take dot products between the on the left-hand side and the individual columns of the matrix on the right-hand side. So if I want to find R1 by M, here I know that M is 5 and N is 4. So R1, R2, R3, all the way to R5. When I want to find the kth entry, I take X dot kth column of a transpose. So for example, r1 is going to be x dotted with column 1 of the transpose. So that's x1 times a11 plus x2 times a12 plus x3 times a13 plus x4 times a14. That's exactly what we see here we get the scalarized entry by entry definition for our vector. Notice that leads to a general approach where I take the sum from j equals 1 to n of x sub j a k j. We were trying to show that r k is equal to b k. And the only difference that we've seen in these formulas is that this one has x on the left.
side. This one has X on the right hand side. The indices actually line up in the exact same way. The index for X entries lines exactly with the column index for A entries. The row index for A entries lines exactly with the element number of the output. Indeed, every one of these is a scalar scalar multiplication, so they are commutative. I can switch orders and we see exactly that RK is equal to BK for all values K that I want. In other words, the two vectors that we desire to show are the same. Indeed, every entries are the same, which means the vectors are identical. This makes sense intuitively because when we say A times X transpose, remember every entry of this vector is going to be the of a dotted with the vector of x. When I take the transpose, the entries say the same. Where we put them is the thing that changes. But x transpose times a transpose is the individual vector x transpose dotted with the columns of a transpose. The columns of a transpose are the rows of a. So when I take x transpose dotted with the columns, that's the same thing as taking x dotted with the rows in reverse order. And that's exactly what we've seen. The nice thing is now that we've done the proof in a base case scenario, a simpler situation, all we need to do is change the actual numbers to general values m and n. And we get a general proof of the first proposition using a scalarized approach. In other words, let's start with our example and consider a times x equals b for any m by n matrix A and any n by one vector x. Notice that the entry in row one column K of B transpose is the same thing as entry in row one column K of A times X transpose, which we know we can get rid of the transpose. So this is going to be entry K comma one of A times X. We have the dot product definition of matrix column vector multiplication, which says that this entry is given by row K of A transpose dotted with x. In colon notation, this is the kth row of a transpose dotted with x. So treat that row as a column vector. This becomes ak1 times x1 plus ak2 times x2 plus da 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 da, akn times xn, where these indices align here and the row index of the entries of a aligns with the entry of the output that we're searching for. In summation notation, this means that the kth entry of the output is the sum from j goes from 1 to n of akj xj. As we saw in the simple case that we generated, the major difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side is the order of multiplication. These are two scalars. We can flop those. That's called commutativity. So this is the sum from j goes from 1 to n of xj times akj, which of course is the vector x dotted with the kth row of the matrix A. But the kth row of A is the same thing as saying the kth column of A transpose. So this becomes x dotted with the kth column of the transpose vector. And that is exactly entry one comma k of x transpose times a transpose. This was true for all values from k goes from one to n, which means a times x transpose is the same thing as x transpose times a transpose. That's exactly what we wanted to show. Here we've taken a scalarized approach. Some of our most gifted mathematicians are also professors and very novice educators. Another way to say this is in a lot of your classes, the moment you get one answer, a lot of mathematicians will say you're done learning. I fundamentally dis disagree with that approach for developing deep competencies in mathematics. Another way to say that is in deep mathematical learning, I like to encourage you to ask yourself, can I attack the same problem in multiple ways? Can I search for and construct multiple representations for the same mathematical ideas? Here we're developing a proof. So we might ask ourselves, can we prove the same result in a different way? Of course, in all of our work doing matrix vector multiplication, we've developed two different approaches for each type of operation we did. One of them was scalarized, the other was vectorized. Let's go ahead and show that the transpose of A times X is actually equal to X transpose times A transpose, but this time we'll do it in a vectorized form. When we say vectorize, what we mean is instead of looking at individual entries of the output vector A times X and individual entries of the output of X transpose times A transpose, let's deal with these outputs as an entire vector. So thinking about those as linear combinations of the appropriate data in A or linear combinations of the appropriate data from A transpose. We'll use that same creative approach of simplifying our general problem by looking at a specific case. We want it to be large enough to be interesting, but small enough to be useful. In this situation, we'll go ahead and set M equal five and N equal four. And let's remind ourselves, if I want to take a vectorized approach to the matrix column vector multiplication, pause the video, test yourself. What is the linear combination version of matrix column vector multiplication? It must be 
chop up A into individual columns, and then take a linear combination of those column vectors with scalar multiples coming from the rows of X. In other words, B is equal to X1 times A1 plus X2 times A2, all the way to the last nth column, which is going to be Xn times An. Here, N is 4, so we stop there. Each of these is an M by 1 vector. In this case, M is 5, so I can write those down. This is going to be X1 times column 1, which has 5 entries, x2 times column 2, all the way down to the nth vector, x4 times column 4. In this case, we're trying to take the transpose of the output, which means we're going to take the transpose of this linear combination. We might think to ourselves, do we know anything about taking the transpose of a vector vector sum? We remember back to the algebraic properties of vector transposes. When I take the transpose of a vector vector sum, that's the same thing as taking the sum of the individual vectors transposed. And the same thing is true when I take the transpose of a scalar vector multiplication, that's the same thing as taking a scalar times the vector transpose. In other words, this transpose passes through all of the sums and all of the scalar vector multiples to produce B transpose equals X1 times the first column as a row vector plus X2 times the second column as a row vector all the way down to xn times the nth column as a row vector. Here, n is 4 and m is 5, so I can write those down specifically. But I actually have notation to encapsulate what's happening here. This means B transpose is the vector x written as a row vector. And then each individual row here comes from the individual columns of A. So this is going to be the first column of A written as a row vector, the second column of A written as a row vector, third column, and fourth column. But notice that when I take the individual columns of A and transpose it, that's the same thing as taking the individual rows of the transpose. Since, of course, the kth row of A transpose is the same thing as saying the kth column of A hit with a transpose operation. But notice this is exactly X transpose times A transpose, which means when I take A times X transpose, that was B transpose, that's identical to X transpose times A transpose, that's exactly what we wanted to show. Of course, we've done that for a specific M and N, but the techniques that we've generated actually works for any values of M and N. Let's go ahead and do that general proof right now. If I take B equals to A times X, the linear combination version of matrix column vector multiplication says chop A into columns and then scale each column by the appropriate coefficient in X, which means I sum from k goes from 1 to n, x sub t times the kth column of a. When I take the transpose of that output, that means I'm going to take the transpose of this sum. So this is going to be the transpose of the sum from k goes from 1 to n of x sub k times a sub k. We saw in our base case that transpose goes through vector addition and scalar vector multiplication. So each of the sum ends is now going to be hit with a transpose, which means I'm going to take the sum from k goes from 1 to n of x transpose times the transpose of the kth column of a. But the transpose of the kth column of a is exactly the kth row of a transpose. So now we take the sum from k goes from 1 to n of x sub t times the kth row of the transpose. But that is exactly the linear combination definition of row vector matrix multiplication. The matrix that we're using there is A transpose, and now X shows up on the left-hand side as a row vector. There's a general proof, and we now have two different approaches. First community challenge, I can't help but asking, can you generate a third version? Is there a way to show this in a different way that we haven't thought about? Second part of our community challenge is, we've just shown part one in two different ways. Go ahead and try part two on your own. See if you can use what we've done to generate a proof for part two. If you really want to have fun doing this, cover up our work. Don't look back at it. Make your brain work hard to remember. Then when you get stuck, look back at your notes. That's called active recall. It's one of the best ways to generate memory. Another really good way to do this is to teach this to somebody that's never seen it before. Those who can do, those who teach do better. Teaching is perhaps one of the best way to strengthen your neural pathway because you have to live in front of somebody generate the entire process for yourself. The moment you can do that, you'll master this content, no doubt. Let's end this video by talking about what this means in terms of computer modeling. This is one of the most advanced topics in mathematical definitions because we're turning math into computer code. What this theorem tells us is that if I want to calculate X transpose times A, this is a row vector matrix multiplication. Our theorem tells us that we don't have to do row vector matrix multiplication. Instead, we can use matrix column vector multiplication first. So if I want to find X transpose times A, 
I can also find a transpose times x, so do matrix column vector multiplication using the transpose of my original matrix. Then I can just take the transpose of the output to get the original row vector that I was searching for. So first do matrix column vector multiplication, hit it with a transpose, and I get row vector matrix multiplication, which is really exciting when I'm thinking about coding because one of the things that's interesting in coding is for every computational task that we want, we might have to spend multiple hours coding a function to achieve that task. That's called modularization and function-based programming. But here I have two different computational tasks which means if I were to do these separately, I'd need a code to produce row vector matrix multiplication and a separate set of code to produce matrix column vector multiplication. This theorem tells me, no, I don't need two different functions. I can use one function and then just deal with the output appropriately. With that observation, we end this video. We're gonna springboard this into actual coding projects to show you just what this means in terms of time saved for the coder. I'll see you in those videos.